we're coming to you here from our offices at Clyde Road. Um, and even though we don't have a live audience, I'm very pleased that I'm joined here by our research team. I have Dev O'Neill, Professor Dev O'Neill from Tally University Hospital here beside me, Dimitra Exidu, and Tom Gray from Trinity House at Trinity College Dublin. And we're very fortunate that we had have, have the capacity and capability here in Ireland to carry out this piece of research and development of the Universal Design Guidelines. Um, so some of you joining us here today may be already familiar with our work. We have a remit to promote universal design that is um, including promoting the development or the incorporation of universal design in standards and in education. And this project that we're launching today is one of a number of projects that we've done that relate to COVID-19. Um, it also relates to other work that we've done in the area, including work with Trinity House. So back in 2015, we would have published our universal design guidelines for homes in Ireland and our dementia friendly dwellings work um, with the aim of improving the design of mainstream housing so that it works well for everyone including people with disabilities and ensuring that older people can live as long as possible at home. Um, we've also been pleased to work in partnership with Trinity House and Tally University Hospital also on the development of the D dementia friendly hospital guidelines. But let me bring you to our agenda today. So we are going to start off today with a short welcome from Helen Guinan, who's chair of the National Disability Authority. And then we're also very pleased that uh, Minister Anne Rabbit TD um, has going to formally launch the guidelines for us. Then we're going to have Professor Dev O'Neill set the context for the research. And also then we have a video with residents testimony of the lived experience of living in a nursing home during the pandemic. After that, then, we're going to hand over to our research team. Demetra and Tom are going to talk us through the research methodology, the findings, and the universal design guidelines. And that's going to be followed by some reflections on the project from Celine Clark of Age Action and Emer Coveney from Age Friendly Ireland, who are both on the steering group for the project. Then we're going to have some questions and answers before we close the seminar. So please, if you have questions, as you're listening to the presentations, put them into the questions and answers. They'll be fed up to us here, and hopefully we'll have a really dis good discussion at the end of the presentations. So um, I'm going to start now with our first presentations. So we have the chair of the NDA, Helen Guinan, followed by Minister Anne Rabbit, uh, the Minister with Responsibility for our Disabilities is going to formally launch the guidelines. Good morning, everyone. I am delighted to add my welcome to you here today to the launch of our new research and our universal design guidelines for improving quality of life and enhancing COVID-19 infection control in existing residential long-term care settings for older people in Ireland, or nursing homes, as many of us would usually call them. And while today is a positive occasion, I'm very conscious uh, this morning that many of you with family in a nursing home or working in the sector have had an extremely difficult time over the last two years. And the research and the guidelines that we commissioned were with the aim of learning from the pandemic. But before we move to share our findings with you, I want to acknowledge the negative impact of COVID-19, in particular on those living in residential long-term care settings and their families. And I hope that what we share this morning won't be upsetting for you, but I do acknowledge that some of it may be. Here at the NDA, we have been working to spread the good news on universal design for the last 15 years uh, through our Centre for Excellence in Universal Design. And at the heart of our work is the, de the belief that good design works well for everyone. And this is true for our roads and our streets. It's true for our public spaces, our public buildings, and it is also true for our homes. We also like to emphasize that aging is ordinary and disability is a part of human life. 
All our needs and our abilities change as life progresses. Uh, so it's real for all of us. And the concept of universal design is very much a part of designing for our future selves. The documents we are launching here today place an emphasis on quality of life and the fact that a residential long-term care setting is a home rather than an institution. And the term nursing home can make us think of clinical settings uh, and you will know that you will see that we don't use that language uh, in the documents and in the publications. Many of you will be familiar with our 2015 uh, publication, Universal Design Guidelines for Homes in Ireland, which are aimed at the design of housing. And it is very interesting and it's hardly surprising that the key principles in our Universal Design Guidelines for Homes are also very relevant for the design of residential long term care settings for older people emphasizing that these uh, settings should first and foremost be seen as a home rather than as an institution. I think that for all of us, the design of our homes has come to the forefront during the pandemic as we were spending so much time within our four walls. And I know that I became very conscious uh, of the de design of my home and its impact on my well-being. Uh, and the impact of the built environment, it, it, it's not just about accessibility. It also includes good lighting and our views and our access to the outdoors. And I think you will see that reflected in today's guidelines and the research when Tom and Demetra from Trinity House present to us this morning. To conclude, I would like to take the opportunity to thank all of the steering group involved in this project and also those who participated in the research studies and interviews. Thank you all. A big thanks to those at Trinity House and Tallow University Hospital for conducting the research. And last but not least, a big thanks to our hardworking staff in the Centre for Excellence in Universal Design at the National Disability Authority. I trust that you will all find the research findings helpful and I hope that they will be practical and useful to you in your lives and in your work. Thank you very much. Hello everyone. It's great to formally launch new research and universal design guidance for improving quality of life and enhancing COVID-19 infection control in existing residential care settings for older people. The COVID-19 pandemic has disproportionately affected older persons and in particular those living in residential long-term care settings. It's important to acknowledge uh, that and learn from it. This work focuses on how the design of built environment impacts both on quality of life and infection control in residential long-term care settings. I would like to thank everyone involved in the case studies, interviews and consultations, which all fit in to the research and the guidelines being launched today. The work has been carried out during a very difficult and busy time for many of you, and credit is due to those who contributed. As you are aware, a key element of universal design approach is user engagement. And I was reassured to read that the research process involved and took account of the diverse needs of residents, staff, family members, and other visitors, regardless of their age, size, ability, or disability. I thought it was striking to see in the findings that many of the design elements that have benefits for quality of life can also contribute to better infection control. This is an important finding for how we can successfully retrofit our existing residential care settings for older people. For example, having access to good quality outdoor space and fresh air is important for everyone's well-being and mental health. 
Having access to outdoor space became critical during the pandemic when we found out that meeting outdoors reduced our risk of infection and could allow for safer visits with family and friends. The guidelines have recommendations on how we can design these outdoor spaces to meet the needs of residents and visitors in the future, including providing a degree of shelter and age-friendly seating. I am conscious that the guidance is in this current document is based on research showing that smaller settings may be preferable from the point of view of quality of life outcomes and infection control. However, aside from the 2017 HICWA guidance on dementia care or the HSE dementia specific household brief, there is currently no national policy in relation to the maximum or minimum numbers of residents that an RLTC setting should cater for. This contrasts with national policy in relation to residential services for persons with disabilities. The government policy is to decongregate settings with more than 10 persons to a model of community living where there's a maximum of four residents living with support staff. I'm also conscious that this issue was raised in the COVID-19 nursing homes expert panel examination of measures to 2021. The research and the guidelines that are being launched today contain findings and recommendations to inform and support further policy development in this area. To finish up, I would like to take the opportunity to thank all the team in the Centre for Excellence in Universal Design at the National Disability Authority, as well as Trinity College Dublin and Tala University Hospital. I am pleased to formally launch both publications. Thank you very much to Helen and to Minister Rabbit uh, for those opening remarks and for the formal launch of our research and guidelines today. You will have heard one of our key messages reflected there by Helen, that nursing homes are a person's home and should be designed and retrofitted to feel like a home. Our next presentation is from um, Professor Des O'Neill, who is a consultant geriatrician at Tally University Hospital and a member of our research team. So Des is going to set some context um, for the research project for us and also talk about the impact of COVID-19 in the nursing home sector. Hello, good morning. I'm delighted to welcome you here for this really important launch of a new direction and reconsidering how we design, build, plan, and indeed look at retrofitting current nursing homes uh, in Ireland. My name is Professor Des O'Neill. I'm a consultant geriatrician at Tallaght University Hospital and Piedmont Healthcare, where I also direct mm -hmm. care for a 50 bedded nursing home. So as the French would say, I have my hand in the dough and have everyday experience of care in nursing homes. And indeed have in the past written uh, in the Lancet about the last years of my own mother's life in a nursing home and how richly rewarding they can be if set and contextualized in the right sort of way. This has been a hugely challenging few years for residents in nursing homes, the families of those who have been living in nursing homes, their staff, and I think an awareness in the general population. And I think we need to be very sensitive in how we present our presentation today in remembering uh, the huge toll that COVID, the coronavirus pandemic, took on nursing homes uh, with 40% of the deaths in outbreaks occurring in nursing home settings. We've got to bear in mind that there are about 25,000 places in nursing homes for residents, and there are about 5 million people living on the Republic of Ireland. So for 40% of the beds to occur in a tiny fraction of the places suggests that there is indeed a need for a major reflection 
on how we plan, care, provide, and build resilience into nursing homes. And indeed, one of the things that worries me sometimes is often one of the most common things I hear within the general population, oh, I'd hate to go and live in a nursing home. This is deeply negative and counterproductive thinking because the statistics tell us that about one in four of us have a chance of spending time in a nursing home before we die. And actually we should be changing our thinking from I'd hate to end up in a nursing home to I want to be part of a society that creates an environment in a nursing home that I will welcome the opportunity of being supported, of being flourished, of being able to flourish, of um, feeling that I will be protected from uh, excess death and mortality and morbidity from infections and pandemics, uh, where I will have choice, where I will be able to go out, where I'll be able to meet people. And a key part of this has been a recognition through the ministerial panel after COVID, although many of its recommendations seem to have faltered in their implementation. But we are pleased this morning, in conjunction with the Centre for Excellence in Universal Design, to be able to present fresh thinking on the design and the built environment of nursing homes. And over this morning, you're going to hear a number of presentations about how we can start rethinking and reshaping the nursing home environment that represents a common feint for you, for me, and for the rest of Irish citizens. And of course, the government policy for us as we age or for us with disability is to support care in the community to the greatest extent possible. But when a certain degree of disability or supports required has a higher intensity and frequency than can be realistically managed at home, then we need to be thinking about congregated settings. In congregated settings, by this we usually mean nursing homes. And in this setting, there are two key challenges. The challenges are those of it being a home. And home is where you feel at home, where you feel you've got your privacy, where you've got choice, where you relax in an environment that to the greatest extent possible, you have shaped through um, your pictures, through the way you set your furniture, through your rhythms and routines. But it's also nursing as well. It's nursing in the sense that the things that made you need to go to a congregated setting or a nursing home are levels of disability for which we need support. And very often multiple uh, illnesses may present and it's around getting the balance right. Our project, uh, and we are very grateful for the uh, insight and foresight of the Center for Excellence in Universal Design, the only such center funded by the state anywhere in the world, to bring a project, and we have a similar broader project with Science Foundation Ireland, which complements this, a focus on two key areas, particularly in terms of um, the pandemic. The first is that of pandemic resilience, and the second is that of quality of life. And indeed, perhaps we should turn these around. But as you will see, it is likely that each of these features is similar to the other. And th this is a very timely uh, research project because the fact that 40% of outbreak related deaths occurred among a population grouping of 25,000 suggests that indeed the Irish nursing home system had not built in resilience and reserve at many levels uh, to engage with or cope or prepare us 
for pandemics and pandemics will continue as will epidemics and these are areas we need to bring together. I think some of the findings you will find during the course of the presentations will be ones that you would say that seems kind of obvious but in fact um, there has been relatively little thought to date in public policy uh, in our national standards as to how our nursing homes should reflect our independence, how our nursing homes should reflect uh, the facilitation of socialization, facilitation of outdoor space, of greenery, of gardens. Uh, and I think a key element is to make sure that while we're preparing for pandemic preparedness, i.e. in terms of infection control, is we're not creating an environment that is sterile in the wrong sense of the word, that is sterile whereby it um, makes us not feel at home. So these are key challenges, and we would hope that these will inform uh, future standards, future standards of building. Some of these concepts will add, it would appear, to the cost but there have been analyses undertaken, for example, of the greenhouse model, that in terms of quality of life, in terms of infection control, that we should be moving towards models which encompass a much more domestic sense of scale and style uh, in the units, a uh, greater sense of empowerment. And I think this will become increasingly clear. We'd like to thank uh, ahead of time all the nursing homes in the study which helped and participated in terms of questionnaires, in terms of survey of the residents who allowed this, the uh, relatives and staff, and we found exceptional uh, enthusiasm and support. Those in the sector, those living there, those, their families, uh, the staff, uh, the direction, they wish to see movement forwards then if you wish to see direction given uh, we'd like i'd like to thank uh, the research team who have worked assiduously this is in a series of projects which has arisen out of dementia friendly housing uh, dementia friendly hospitals and i think we're reaching an area that perhaps is somewhat less has had less focus in ireland than it should which is how should we build design shape and indeed retrofit nursing homes so that they reflect an ideal within which we would all live, which allow for a true sense of quality of life and home, but also uh, allow us to uh, have our settings prepared so that we have resilience, reserve, and the ability to cope with epidemics and pandemics. Diane Antill, the famous British uh, writer, wrote movingly of a life of empowerment in nursing homes. And I think that these uh, findings this morning uh, will perhaps spark and catalyze debate and discussion as to how best this can be forged. Uh, as you will see, we have had many also um, collaborators from advocacy, uh, from Nursing Homes Ireland, which represents the owners of the uh, many, many private nursing homes. And these have all come together uh, in a spirit of trying to do better. So hopefully this morning will energize you, make you think, and will help move the whole process further so that nursing homes will be places that we will be not saying, I'd hate to end up in a nursing home, but we're saying this is somewhere that provides a built environment, which hopefully is parallel to the care processes, where I will feel that I will be able to be the best possible me that I can be. Thank you.
User engagement is a key cornerstone of universal design, and we felt it was really important that we would have the residents' voice here at our launch today. So we were really pleased that the restrictions were lifted in time for us to be able to go in and record uh, Eileen and Bridget talking about their experiences, and we'll have their presentation now. Then the pandemic came, and uh, we couldn't have visitors. And I missed that quite a lot. I missed really, it's a bit selfish of me, but I missed them really bringing me in a cake or something nice, you know, because the food is just monotonous. <laughs> it's, it's a bit different every day, but there's no difference in the taste every day, no matter what the dishes shop, it's the same thing. And uh, that, but I, I would, I got back to myself with the activities here. I love the art. I love painting. I did, I do quite a lot of pictures. But I love the art and I love the pottery. Yeah, I made a lovely clock. It's one of the things I made, and it's. I was giving it to my, I give most of my stuff to my family, you know, but my son always wanted this clock, but I had no battery for it. He wouldn't take it without the battery. Oh, I felt like giving it a good clip across the ear hole. But anyway, it, he has it now and it's done. And he, everybody is admiring it and he's, he's very proud of it. But the pottery is lovely and uh, they are, they're my two big things. Bingo is nice, as I say, it just passes the time. And then we have music that comes in now, that the, now, that the, uh, now that we can have visitors, you know. The music comes back again, and it's lovely to, you know, just hear a bit of music. I like that. Um, yeah, but Bridget and I get on very well. But so that's it. So there's just Bridget and myself that kind of get on together, but the fact that we can we can only mix with the ground floor, even yet. It, it limits us very much. Like you know, we have we depend on the staff a lot for conversation and that, and they're very good. But uh, please God, soon we'll be able to mix with all floors again. And the the reason we're paired is the same staff look after us. You know, that's the only. That's the only. The, we're not alike at all because we they don't. Come, they come, might come into the art or they mightn't, but they don't do any, you know, I mean, they just sit there and talk and, you know, if they're happy, that's it, you know. So, and then they just get up and they hold one another's hands and they're walking around and, you know, that. It's just because of the staff. Oh, before the pandemic, it was much, much better. And uh, we would have, um, like, parties every so often, you know, like, there'd be wine and Guinness. For the men, there wouldn't be a lot like now. You can just get a glass and that, and there'd be music on, and be singing, and somebody be singing, and be, you know, chatting around and having a good laugh. But the pandemic put an end to all of that. Like we had to stay in our rooms, and that was the worst of it. It's the loneliest place you can be. It's just in the room on your own. You turn on the telly, and it's nothing but COVID, COVID, COVID. And then on the television, would we put on the British stations? And you get this uh, reduced fees for quick cremations. And I mean, <laughs> everybody, all you're hearing about is the number of people who was dying and this cheap cremations coming up next on the news. It was, maybe I found it so ironic that, well, you know, I said, God, somebody not just tell them what to do, <laughs> you know. But, um, yeah, there were every day on you, every news program you put on, it was the number who died and the more who got and the more in hospital. And that was at every hour. You hear it. And you're in the room on your own and you're just wondering, why am I here at all? Like, you know, I got very depressed as it all together, really. I was really, I start going back to my childhood and everything and would feel something's wrong with everything. And but I, I got over it again. And uh, so we have a, a, an artist or a potter. It was one and the same person anyway. He's a Polish man. And he comes in on Wednesdays and Thursdays. And that's what he, that's his job, going to those like nursing homes and places like this. And with the pandemic, they were close to all that. We didn't have him coming in. 
we could paint ourselves, like if we could paint, but not everybody can paint on their own, you know. So that was kind of kind of, we just maybe colouring in. Uh, but I miss my, my, I miss during the pandemic, because I miss most of my grandchildren growing up, because they were very young. Like. Um, I have diabetes and I got a very bad fall. My blood sugars went down. So I was in, ta in Tala Hospital for about six weeks. And they said that I really couldn't be in the house on my own. My husband still works and my children have all left the house. So I would be on my own quite a bit, you know. So that's why I had to come in here. But I'm in here now nearly well, about 18 months. Well, I thought I was only coming in for a short time. I didn't think I'd be here as long. But um, I'm, I'm happy here now, you know. Like I'm on the same floor as Eileen, and, you know, and there's loads of activities all the time. And the pottery, I love the pottery. I've made loads of different bits of pottery. I've made a beautiful little house, you know. Then there's um, there's bingo every, once a week, and there's different things, flower arranging. And we used to go out, you know, on on the bus to different places and go out for lunch, and you know different places to go, go to Phoenix Park and, and yeah, so there was a lot more on than there is now, you know, so the days are very long. Because of the pandemic, we, we spend a lot of time in our bedrooms, really, just, you know, go down for the activity. We have to go straight back up then because we used to be able to go out in the garden and, you know, and then we used to go on outings, like different places, maybe once you could go maybe once a month or something, but that all stopped, you know. We had to go to the Phoenix Park and we'd have afternoon tea and, you know, it was different places, you know, down to Avoca and, you know, it's, but it's it's starting to kind of coming back now again. The staff here are lovely, They're very nice now. Then the activities, and then we meet from, you know, the different floors. And when it was really bad, like I, I was on the second floor, and then I didn't see any of those patients, you know, for a long time. And, but... I'm on the third floor now. It's very nice up there. It's very quiet. And when when the floor started, it was hard. And you couldn't have any visitors or, you know, didn't see my husband for a long time. And now he's sick and he's in the hospice. And Horace Cross is not well at all. And I couldn't go to see him for a good long time, you know. But I... I lie down now maybe once a week to see him. Well, hopefully I'll be getting home. That's, what I'm, that's my main aim at the moment, you know. So thank you very much to Eileen and Bridget for sharing your experiences of living in a nursing home during the pandemic with us. I think everyone listening to that would agree that there's no substitute for, for the person's voice. Um, I just want to remind everybody listening that if you have any questions um, about any of the presentations, please put them into the questions and answers um, that's there on your screen in Zoom webinar. We're now going to move to our next presentation. We have a presentation from Trinity House uh, team member, Dimitra Exidus who is going to talk to us about the uh, methodology in the research, including the user engagement. 
Hello, my name is Dimitri Excitus, and I'm a research fellow in Trinity House here in Trinity College, Dublin. And I'm part of the research team that was involved in this research project, improving quality of life and enhancing COVID-19 infection control in existing residential settings for older persons. In this presentation, I will provide an overview of the research methodology that underpins the research findings and the high level guidelines that we are launching today. This project was funded by the Center for Excellence in Universal Design at the National Disability Authority, and it was completed by Trinity House, Trinity College Dublin, in collaboration with Tala University Hospital. The project focuses on existing public, private, and voluntary residential long-term care settings for older people in Ireland, and it examines how the built environment can be adapted or retrofitted to enhance the quality of life of residents, improve the visitor experience for friends and family members without compromising the quality of life for residents, and improve COVID-19 infection control and pandemic preparedness and resilience while still protecting the psychosocial health and well-being of residents. The main output from the research is a set of high-level universal design guidelines. The research utilized a mixed methods approach and composed of the following. A rapid review of best practice, high-level case studies, three site-based Irish case studies were involved in the research, stakeholder questionnaires which were distributed across the three case studies, a set of expert interviews, and all of this fed into the high-level research findings as well as the universal design guidelines. I just wanted to highlight and to note that the research, the research um, that we're going to talk about here today was undertaken during the height of the COVID-19 pandemic at a time of high restrictions, including in relation to visiting residential long-term care facilities. Nevertheless, I wanted to note that the research and guidelines place the needs and preferences of older persons living in long-term residential care at the center of this work. They considered how the residential long-term care settings can provide better support for family members, visitors, and staff. And by adopting a universal design approach, the research and findings are co-created with key stakeholders. They're people-centered and they address the diverse needs of all users, regardless of their age, size, ability, or disability. In the next few slides, I'm going to go into a little bit more detail about some of the key uh, methodological areas of our research, starting with the rapid review. So a rapid review methodology containing the scope and key questions was developed in conjunction with the project steering committee. The scope outlined the key site and building areas to be examined, and these included site entry and site layout, entering and moving about inside the, the facility, key internal and, exter and external spaces, elements, and systems. The main research question focused on how the built environment in existing residential long-term care settings can be retrofitted or adapted to help create a balanced approach between residential quality of life, infection control, and overall setting pandemic resilience. Underneath this main uh, research question, there were a number of sub-questions that we were asking. These included, what are the key quality of life issues in residential long-term care in Ireland? What are the key built environment features and building operation issues that underpin quality of life for older people in existing residential long-term care settings in Ireland? Thirdly, we were asking what are the main universal design issues in terms of accessibility, understanding, and usability for all users within residential long-term care settings? What are the main built environment and building operation issues related to COVID-19 and infection control in existing settings? And finally, what are the main convergences and divergences between quality of life and universal design features and COVID-19 building related infection control measures? The aim of this review was to examine the peer reviewed and grade literature to identify national and international best practice regarding universal design and key built environment issues in residential long term care settings. From this review, key successful built environment features and building related operational measures were identified, 
A total of 126 documents across peer review and gray literature were identified and reviewed, and the results provide an evidence base to underpin key adaptation and retrofit guidelines from a universal design approach. Following on from the rapid review, I'm going to now take you through a few slides that describe some of our key stakeholder engagement activities, starting with the case studies. So to investigate and categorize successful residential long-term care approaches and measures in relation to quality of life and COVID-19 infection control, the research team selected and conducted comprehensive stakeholder engagement in three Irish case studies in the Tala University Hospital catchment area. These settings are largely based on a conventional or traditional model of care rather than any specific model such as the household model or similar. Unlike a household model, which breaks the setting down into smaller clusters, each gathered around a dedicated living area, traditional or conventional models tend to have less differentiation between areas and usually provide one or two larger living areas for all residents. The settings that make up these case studies uh, were chosen for the following two reasons. Members of the research team from Tala University Hospital were familiar with them and could facilitate engagement, and they represent a mix of small, medium, and large settings, new build and existing or repurposed buildings, and they represented rural and suburban settings. The first of the case studies is TLC City West. So in terms of location, it is suburban. It's large in size with 139 resident spaces. It is four stories. Its ownership is private. It's part of a larger chain. It's a new build based on the conventional model, and it is not co-located with any other facilities. The second of the case studies is Millbrook Manor. It's rural. It's of medium size with 63 resident spaces. It's two stories high. It's privately owned. It is a new build based on the traditional model, and it, it is not co-located with any other facilities. Finally, Sally Park Nursing Home. It's suburban. It's considered small to medium with 43 resident spaces. It's three stories high. It's privately owned. It's an existing country house with new build extensions. And it's based on the traditional model. And like the other two case studies, it is not co-located with any other facilities. Across all three case studies, we developed three separate questionnaires which were designed and circulated to capture the experiences of three specific stakeholder groups, residents, family members, and staff. For residents, they completed questionnaires with sections related to quality of life, universal design, the impact of COVID-19 and infection control in general, and questions specific to key spatial skills. For the family members and staff, they completed similar questionnaires, with the exception that neither of these groups were asked any questions related to quality of life. In total, across the three case studies, we collected and analyzed 11 resident, 19 family, and 13 staff questionnaires. We would like to extend our appreciation to the staff for helping us to distribute and collect the questionnaires as we were unable to be on, on site ourselves. Preliminary findings from the first group of case studies note the impact of COVID-19 related infection control measures had on the quality of life of residents, including isolations from family and from other residents due to social distancing, as well as confusion or difficulty with PPE and having, uh, having unduly affected members of this vulnerable group. However, high quality of care and a commitment to maintaining <coughs> excuse me, and a commitment to maintaining as much normalcy for residents as possible have been important aspects of nursing home responses to residents' needs. In parallel to the stakeholder engagement and the questionnaires, we also um, uh, completed a technical data sheet in each of the three case studies to capture key information on the built environment. Specifically, we were looking for information relating to overarching design characteristics, features, or approaches relating to the setting, 
And then in addition to the remaining questions, they all align with the various spatial scales that we were focusing on. So specifically looking at site location, balancing access and interaction with the community, site design in terms of site layout, access and movement, overall building layout and circulation in terms of access, resident staff and visitor movement, key internal and external spaces in terms of spatial size, scale, comfort, accessibility, building elements and components. We are looking at finishes, furnishings, and fittings in terms of homeliness, hygiene, usability, and accessibility. We look at the internal environment in terms of ventilation and air quality, heating and natural light. And finally, we asked questions around assistive technology, therapeutic technology, and ICT in terms of providing support, common spaces, and communication. Another element of our stakeholder engagement involved a series of stakeholder, uh, excuse me, of expert interviews. So as part of the engagement process, the research team conducted 18 interviews with key experts in various fields related to residential long-term care for older persons. The interviews were conducted online through video conferencing platform through Zoom. And we had a semi-structured interview template that was created to guide the interviews. It was made up of three separate parts. The first part of the template was, it was asking participants to reflect on the COVID-19 pandemic and its particular impact on residential long-term care facilities in Ireland. Part B of the template was the role of design in improving quality of life and addressing infection control measures in long-term care facilities. And part C was looking at the way forward, key policy and practice issues that need to be considered. So I'm just gonna take a moment to um, highlight um, some of the organizations that were involved in the interview process. So we had um, interviews with um, the following organizations, with the Center for Excellence in Universal Design, HSC Capital and States, Nursing Homes Ireland, Age Action, Age, Age Friendly Ireland, TLC Nursing Homes, we held four separate interviews with representatives from ICWA, Care Champions. We also interviewed representatives from the Irish Association of Directors of Nursing and Midwifery, SAGE Advocacy. We, had, we interviewed an infection control and ventilation advocate. We interviewed um, representatives from Tallinn University Hospital. We also spoke with representatives from the Department of Health. And finally, we also had interviews with all, the All-Ireland Gerontological Nurses Association. We're very grateful for their participation in the interview process. Each of the interviews was very rich and enriching and provide additional evidence and support for the development of the guidelines that uh, my colleague Tom Gray will speak more about in a few moments. Finally, I wanted to also share that we had uh, one workshop during the uh, research uh, project. And the aim of the workshop was to, um, which was held actually in June, 2021. And the aim of the workshop was to share research findings to date, including an overview of the three case studies and preliminary results from the questionnaires and some of the interviews. In addition, we used the opportunity of the stakeholder workshop to develop and deliver a practical exercise to capture participants' lived experience of home. The participants of the workshop included steering committee members from CBD, Age Friendly Ireland, BHSC, as well as research team members in TCD and Tallinn University Hospital. We also had staff and residents from two of our case study um, sites, Millbrook Manor and TLC City West. The practical exercise involved the writing of individual memory text based on photographs or objects that held significance for the participants in relation to the question, what does home mean to us? So during the session, participants presented and spoke about a variety of images and objects, including old and current family photographs, photos of their home or garden, photos of personal belongings that conjured memories of home, or images of objects such as teacups or tea bags that represented the everyday and important rituals of home. While this was only a short workshop with a limited number of participants, it starts to show us how the meaning of home aligned with many of the quality of life issues in residential long-term care settings, including safety and security, self-realization, personal growth, pleasure and enjoyment, social engagement and relationships, meaningful activities, sense of home and sense of place, 
and contact with nature. I will now turn over to my colleague, Tom Gray, who will present high-level key research findings as well as the high-level university the universal design guidelines, both of which have been underpinned by the methodology and stakeholder engagement that I have described during this presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Demetra, for that presentation. Um, we have some two questions, I think, that have come up in the live chat. The first is whether the research and guidelines are available, and yes, they are available on our website. It's uh, universaldesign.ie, and if you click on the built environment section, you'll find them there. And I think my colleague Linda has also um, put that link into the chat. Secondly, someone has asked if the slides will be available after the launch. So we're recording our webinar this morning, and it will be uploaded to our YouTube channel. Um, if you want the PowerPoint specifically, please email us at info at ceud.ie, and we'll be able to share that with you. Uh, we're now going to move on to our next presentation, which is from Tom Gray, the re a research member at Trinity House. And Tom is going to talk to us about the research findings and the universal design guidelines which are underpinned by the research. So I'm going to talk about the research report and, and of course the universal design guidelines that have come out of this project and that are underpinned by, by the research report and the findings. Um, so I'm only going to highlight some of the key findings, some of the key areas from, from the report because it's quite a long document, um, detailed document, over 100 pages and 120 refer uh, literature references. So I want to talk today now um, about some key aspects of the research and, and where we focused. First of all, around the role of the built environment in long-term residential care settings and the impact it has on residents, staff, and so on. Um, and the benefits of taking of a universal design approach and how this can support diverse uh, care needs across key spatial scales in, in a setting. And then a really important element around quality of life and how that, this has really underpinned um, the project and the guidelines. Of course, we're going to look at COVID-19 uh, transmission routes and the built environment implications for that and the overall impact on, on these settings. We we'll quickly highlight a few of the example recommendations across key scales, just to give you a sense of, of the kind of content within in the report and also what, what then gets fed into the guidelines. But I think really importantly, we want to um, really emphasize the convergence between design for improving quality of life and, and design for improved COVID-19 infection control. And I suppose this is a key part of, of the findings and so, you know, a very important element that has emerged from the research. So first of all, just to talk about the role of the built environment um, in long-term care settings. And when we say the built environment, of course, we're talking about things like location, we're talking about the the surrounding neighborhood and the community, we're talking about site design, we're talking about building design, we're talking about furniture, air quality, lighting, heating, technology, lots of elements to consider. We also know that this pandemic has, has sadly um, illustrated the role and quality of space and, and the implications there are around things like social distancing, um, isolation or quarantine, room occupancy levels, um, along with elements like um, air quality and other internal environment issues. All of these have immediate and, and long lasting effects um, on the built environment in terms of planning, uh, architecture and design. Um, and this is something that we really need to take from these findings and, and inform uh, how we approach um, existing settings. So, in terms of the impact of COVID um, and the role of the built environment, we know there is primary and, and secondary impacts. Um, when we look at how UNICEF defined this, they talk about primary impacts of an outbreak are defined in terms of the direct and immediate consequences, like illness um, and sadly death. Secondary impacts are defined as those that the epidemic indirectly causes, um, such as loneliness and, and isolation and so on. And the built environment has 
um, has a role and um, a part to play in both. So first of all, when we look at some of the primary impacts, and we're talking about the introduction and spread of the virus into a setting. Well, some international findings show us that larger settings um, and those with higher levels of foot traffic and movement were, were more prone to in infections getting into the setting. Um, lack of single rooms was an issue, of course. Lack of suitable visiting spaces. If people were visiting and didn't have adequate spaces, it was bringing the virus in and causing it to spread. Poor ventilation was an issue and it has become really to the fore and lack of suitable staff facilities in terms of cha changing and, and so on. Then in terms of the secondary impacts, um, we, and, and you know, these are around the loneliness and isolation, uh, lack of physical activity, lack of contact with nature, and then staff and family stress. The built environment um, was influential here also in terms of, again, lack of suitable visiting space. If people could, if there wasn't, proper space for people to visit, then they couldn't. Um, lack of outdoor space. We see in some settings where there wasn't adequate outdoor space that family members could visit or indeed the residents themselves could socialize in. Um, again, lack of, of, of staff facilities. We knew that staff, we know that staff um, were working under extreme uh, pressure throughout the pandemic and, and lack of proper facilities added to their stress. And then in some cases, we saw inadequate um, technology and so on in terms of communication with family, um, things that would have allevi alleviated some of the burden of isolation. Um, the, the role of universal design here is, is really critical. Um, and this is about catering to a wide spectrum of care needs across multiple scales. First of all, we know that long-term care set settings did cater to a a huge diversity. You know, when we look at any setting, we know that a proportion of residents might be quite mobile and they might be able to get out of bed by themselves and, and move around or even leave, leave, the, 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 leave the setting and go out and about in the community. But many residents will have much higher care needs and they'll require a significant degree of assistance from staff and family members and technology and so on. So a universal design um, recognizes these diverse care needs and helps to, in create, to create an, an inclusive setting that supports this diversity of needs. It's also acknowledged that we also understand that um, long-term care settings uh, need to cater to a, a huge range of people. We're starting with the residents themselves, but we're also talking about staff of various ages and abilities. We're talking about various visiting um, per other healthcare professionals. We're talking about, of course, family members and so on visiting. So it really becomes this, this space with, with a lot of different people catering to it. And also a universal design approach is, is about um, applying this level of design thinking across spatial scales. Um, so, you know, you have a, have a continuum of support and care that caters to all people regardless of age, size, ability or disability. One of the aspects um, at the very beginning of this research that we wanted to emphasize and, 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 and really stress that it, it was to underpin all of the research, looking at the built environment, looking at infection control, looking at universal design, looking at um, various ways to, to, be, to create as an inclusive environment as possible. We wanted to underpin all of this by a quality of life. Now we went to the literature and we spoke to our stakeholders and we had many conversations about this. Um, and we, we based our approach on, on a couple of key concepts here. First of all, quality of life itself. And, and we know that Kane um, and, and colleagues um, over the last couple of decades have looked a lot at quality of life in long-term care settings, talking about things like security, com com comfort, meaningful activity, relationships, enjoyment, dignity, autonomy, all of these really important things. And then a related but slightly different um, uh, concept around well-being, and, and, and this is about the presence of positive emotions and moods. Um, and this, of course, is based on, on a person's mental and, and social um, conditions, but also really, really influenced by the built environment. And then also looking at the idea of thriving. Um, you know, throughout, all, throughout our lives, we we continue to grow and develop, and this should obviously be the same for older people living in long-term care. So this is human growth throughout our life. 
And this, this requires, you know, optimal um, interactions with, with others, but also our environment. So we wanted to make sure that our approach um, included these key concepts. Now, while we looked at a number of existing sets of quality of life um, issues within long-term care, we found that um, there were certain elements missing that we, we really wanted to emphasize. Things like, you know, the homeliness, um, a sense of place, contact with nature. Now, maybe these are more recent um, considerations or, or, or um, ambitions for long-term care, but we wanted to make sure that they were included. And so there was no set that we could just set of uh, quality of life issues that we could just put our hands to. So we set about creating um, a set that we felt was, was inclusive and integra uh, integrated and took um, a very holistic approach. So we developed um, these four sectors. Um, first of all, physical, sensory and cognitive. And here we looked at things like health and functional status, safety and security, physical and sensory comfort. Then we looked at um, psychological issues around autonomy, control, individuality, um, privacy and dignity, spiritual well-being, pleasure and enjoyment, generativity or, the, or, the, or the, 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 the kind of sense of giving back to the community or contribution. Then we looked at the social quality of life issues around engagement and relationship with others, integration and engagement with the community, meaningful activities. And then finally, um, what we call a kind of a place-based or ecological, this idea of a sense of place and, and a sense of home and this connection with nature, connection with the outsides. And we spent a long time discussing this with, with our key, with the steering committee and our key stakeholders and throughout the process of interviews and so on. And we also mapped all of these um, domains and sectors onto the built environment to ensure that there was something at all scales that dealt with at least some of these. So we've brought this thinking throughout the research and, and throughout, the, throughout the guidelines. And it became a really, really important part of what we were doing. Now, when we look at um, COVID-19 um, transmission um, in terms of the built environment and what the implications are for long-term care or, or nursing home settings, um, we just wanted to go back and look at you know the science and and what best practice um, and the center for disease control you know talk about the key routes for transmission in COVID. first of all the droplet transmission this is exposure to um to respiratory droplets uh, produced by an infected person this is kind of a close range infection this two meter element was mentioned but you know we know it's not as straightforward as that however it is close proximity the second route of transmission was around airborne, and this is exposure to tiny particles um, known as aerosols in the, that, that hang in the air. Um, and this, this is considered, like um, dro droplet transmission, a high risk uh, contagion route. So here we start to see the importance of air quality and, and ventilation and so on. And then finally, contact transmission or fomite transmission. Um, and this was something that was focused on very much in the early days of, of, the, of the pandemic, where the concern was um, virus transmission via direct contact with a person, such as a handshake, or direct contact with, with surfaces, such as door handles, whatever. Um, however, as, as research emerged, it showed that this wasn't as important as the other two routes. And the Center for Disease Control and many others um, have, would now consider this a low risk. So that really helps us think, and it really helps us prioritize um, measures and approaches we might take in existing settings. So going back to the, to the ventilation piece, which was really important in terms of design. Some, um, some very well-respected scholars in this area pub publishing in the likes of the, Lan the Lancet really started to emphasize this element that there was very strong evidence around um, airborne transmission. And, and then the WHO themselves in 2021 talking about building ventilation and the importance of that. So when we bring that together, we see, right, you know, we really need to be careful around things like spacing and proximity to others in settings, occupant number and density, access movement and zoning and circulation, um, access to outdoor space and provision of, 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 of good outdoor space, 
um, for people to be in the outdoors because we know that there's a lower risk of transmission um, in outdoor spaces, but also internally around the air quality and, and ventilation. Now, this work has focused on existing settings and it's about measures to retrofit and adapt um, existing long-term care settings, existing nursing homes. Order, it is really important to still consider you know, all spatial scales because they will have an impact. Where a place is located, where a setting is located, we need to consider that. The public realm around the existing setting, we need to consider that because that will influence how the setting relates to the overall community. It will influence boundary treatment, site design, um, our understanding of air quality within that area. So while we obviously can't move a setting to another location, understanding the location, the public realm, and, and the wider scale is really important um, for existing settings. So in this context, we approached the research um, through a spatial scale framework and a kind of a thematic framework um, that dealt with the kind of wider scale, the, the macro scale of, of the kind of wider uh, community or a town or a city, and then a mesoscale or the kind of in between, and this was the kind of neighborhood or the local community. And then the, the micro scale at looking at the site and the building and drilling in in much greater detail. But first of all, we looked at overarching issues, which were not spatially contingent per se, but, but what are the, the, some of the big issues um, around kinds of care models and so on. So that's almost our kind of first protocol. So that was the first theme um, that we looked at. And then working our way through the spatial scales, the research starts to look at location and, and, and public realm, as I mentioned a minute ago, site design issues there. So important issues around movement on the site, deliveries, the creation and provision of outdoor space, um, layout and circulation of a building in terms of how the overall building is shaped and formed, its height and form and so on, but also about um, entering and moving around the building in terms of circulation, stairs and lifts and so on. And then we, we started to look at key internal spaces, um, the shared living areas, the kitchens, of course, areas like bedrooms, staff areas, but also like key external spaces, like gardens and balconies and, and terraces and so on. And then drilling further into the more, um, in more detail elements, looking at building components, looking at technology, and of course, looking at the internal environment around heating, lighting, but critically, issues like ventilation. So what we did was we, as described earlier on, we brought together the rapid review findings with our stakeholder engagement in, in terms of the case studies, the interviews and the workshops and so on. And you'll find in the report that we brought these together over these spatial scales um, and we pulled out um, some of the, the really key and priority issues that's arising from the literature, but also coming through to us from our stakeholder engagement process. Um, and then trying to knit them together to produce our findings and, and importantly, I suppose, a set of key recommendations that we could bring on and help us underpin the, the design guidelines. So now I'm just going to run through some of the key recommendations. Now, these are only samples at each spatial scale because we'd be here all day otherwise. Um, but just to give you a flavor of what is in the report itself. First of all, in terms of the overarching issues, we looked at care models um, and we looked at overall size of settings and we looked at, um, again, the kind of resident centered models and so on. And the literature and research internationally showing us that, that um, the appropriate um, size of settings was, was an important element, um, not just in terms of the overall number of people on the site, but how these are broken down, whether it's into household units, um, or similar kinds of models. We find that some of these settings, these kind of household models have been shown to improve quality of life. That's coming through very strongly in the literature, um, but also the reducing infection control or infection risk and improving infection control. Now, so when we talk about some of these household models, we're talking about um, settings that are broken down into, into smaller units, maybe up to 12 people, um, that share a common kitchen and common area, um, kind of very homely-like setting, 
and pretty self-contained. Now, some of the models that we see internationally, like the greenhouse model in the US is based on this, and they have dedicated staff members who remain working with those 12 residents and don't generally move within uh, the rest of the setting. Visitors, of course, don't visit a large setting, they just visit that, that household. So evidence was um, that that reduced foot traffic and movement um, in the settings and, and therefore um, lower levels of infection risk. Now that, that has come across in lots of literature at this stage. Moving then from um, the, the kind of overall care models to into the spatial scales and, and starting with this kind of location and integration with the community. Again, as I said, I know we're dealing with existing settings, but still understanding that bigger uh, context is really important. And when we talk about um, proximity to a person's home community, we mean that a resident who might move to a nursing home or a long-term care, care setting close to their existing community. Now the research shows us there's benefits for this in terms of quality of life. You return a sense, retain a sense of home, familiarity, connectedness. Staying close to family, neighbors and friends in terms of outward and inward visiting is made that bit easier. Um, keeping contact with local and, and familiar and favorite places. Now also, there's, a, there's an element of, of resilience here as well. Um, Christy in 2020, when she talks about resilience and dementia, for instance, but apl applicable to, to, to all of us as we age, is this the idea that a sense of connectedness is critical for resilience and therefore proximity to a person's home community may be an important factor in supporting and helping them to adapt to adversity and adversity in, in, in the face of a, of a pandemic or a similar uh, stressful event. So this is just an example of, of some of the findings coming through in terms of proximity to a person's home community. And then when we come in one more level and we look at the adjacent spaces to, to um, any setting and the importance of a pleasant, comfortable, accessible and supportive uh, public realm. Now we know that many issues that support quality of life and, and resilience, um, and that has shown that come through in the literature, things like good public transport, access to amenities, access to outdoor, good outdoor spaces and so on. Um, and of course, these are the things that we saw as really important during, during COVID and, and the pandemic. But these are also beneficial, of course, for residents of a setting and for staff and for family members, pretty obvious. Um, so a well-designed public realm with safe, accessible um, and attractive pedestrian space is also linked to walkability and improved social outcomes for people in general. So therefore, these are important considerations when we think about the community and the location for long term care settings. Moving down then and we start considering site design and the importance of a connected, welcoming, accessible um, pleasant setting with good contact with nature. So we already know the the idea of uh, or the importance of high quality outdoor spaces. Um, but now evidence showing that due to lower infection risk associated with outdoors, that outdoor spaces for group activities and, and, and social activities and visitors using the space is, you know, starts to show the really importance of, of good outdoor spaces. As we move down again into the scales, you find in the report lots of good information around, um, around entering and circling uh, and circulating within the building um, and some of the important considerations there in terms of of infection control and movement just one I've, I've highlighted here today is this idea of the overall building configuration and a number of floors and we saw coming th through in the research that in, in some settings internationally that uh, residents on upper floors um, were more isolated they didn't have contact with outdoor space um, in some cases, or they didn't have the window visit that somebody could literally come. Now, as inadequate as it was, at least it was something. So a recommendation coming here is that in multi-story settings, that residents on all floors should have access to usable and meaningful outdoor space. Now that can be in the shape of balconies, roof terraces, and so on. And we see how this can be achieved in many healthcare settings, but also um, across um, long-term care settings that we've looked at internationally. 
Now, ideally, residents or, or visitors should be able to access people on upper floors also um, by well ventilated spacious circulation areas, ideally without having to go through the common areas of, of, of a building um, of, or of the setting. So that's that's something about the overall configuration and dealing with number of floors and direct access to outdoor space for people living on upper floors. When we start looking at key spaces, we know that the household model that I alluded to earlier on, um, that you know the shared living and, and kitchen and dining areas is really important here. Now, when we're talking about a setting with a smaller amount of people, um, up to 12, for instance, we know from looking and discussing this with some of the settings here in Ireland who, who had this model, that infection control was, was made easier by the smaller amount of people and they could continue sharing spaces. They were almost treated those 12 people or that household like a, like a bubble or like a family. Um, so they didn't necessarily need to isolate from each other as much. There was still a good level of sharing going on within the household. Mind you, sharing with the larger setting um, wasn't the same, but at least there was the social interaction within this household model. So the importance of these well-designed, well-ventilated, good access to outdoor space from shared living, kitchen and dining areas, really critical. Bedrooms, of course, um, an absolutely focal part of a good design for long-term care. And recommendations here are based on international um, best practice, not just COVID related, but prior to this, that spacious single bedrooms with uh, private bathrooms are important for all residents. Ideally, uh, bedrooms, if possible at all, should have some kind of small sitting area and some kind of small kitchenette um, that will allow, uh, facilitate a little bit more autonomy and, 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 and visitors in that space. And the bedroom should be provided with large windows with good views and direct access to outdoor space, if possible, like the example shown. And then when we get into internal environment and air quality, um, this is really critical um, for creating you know, a safe, healthy and comfortable environment. And, and we know that, that, that this has been an issue in a lot of our settings, not just, not just long-term care, but a lot of our health and education settings that poor air, internal air quality is an issue not just in terms of infection, but in terms of quality of life. So this is one of those convergence issues that we'll talk about in a minute. And then we talk about building elements and, and components and finishes and, and fittings and so on. That should be obviously help with infection control. Should we have that balance though with, with being homely and accessible? And then of course, technology in terms of communication and also therapeutic technology. And you'll see that um, covered in the report. Look, one of the things for us that was really important was the convergence between um, issues around long term or around uh, quality of life and good infection control. And so this is really possible. And this in our report, you'll see a graphic. And here it is again, which starts to show across all spatial scales, some really critical convergence between quality of life and good infection control, whether it's the small household models. Um, with the smaller amount of people or down to issues around ventilation. These are essentially the kind of sweet spot in terms of the built environment that if we focus on, we're going to be um, improving lots of things, not just for residents, but also for, for staff members and families and so on. Now I'm gonna give a couple of minutes um, just to talk through um, the, the, the guidelines themselves, which have emerged from the research and are underpinned, of course, by the research. So I'm going to just quickly talk about the aims of the guidelines. I'm going to talk about, again, this key spatial scales, what we've been talking about just now, talking about this idea of, of levels of design um, within, a, within a setting, whether it's a lot, whether it's small scale work or large scale work. I'm going to give you a quick guidelines at a glance, more just to give you a sense of what's in the guidelines. Um, and also just to mention how, of course, all of the research and the guidelines um, are, are better really are closely aligned with and look and, and recognize um, existing key policy in this area. So drawing on the research, the aims of the guidelines is to, is to provide um, guidance for the adaptation and retrofit of existing residential long-term care settings in Ireland that would A, enhance the quality of life for residents, B, improve the visitor um, experience for, for friends and family and, and so on. Um, and also improve the working environments, but also improve pandemic preparedness and resilience into the future. 
In the guidelines, we've dealt with a number of spatial scales as discussed, We're looking at site location and site design, overall building layout and circulation, key internal and external spaces, and then internal environment and systems. And, and this is where we start getting into the ventilation and, and technology and so on. We understand that um, to carry out work in an existing setting can be quite tricky, but we also know that there's, there's the, you know, the small things you can do that can make a really big difference. So we've kind of suggested that there's a number of levels of design or a number of, of kind of levels or scales that you can look at. Um, you might look at simple things like labeling or signage or art or painting or something and that, or planting, um, or literally, you know, the, the, the kind of opening of windows and or the, ensuring that windows can fully open in terms of ventilation. So that's that might have be a minimum or, or no cost or no disruption. And then we work our way up, um, you know, through to ICT, which may not have a big impact on the actual building itself or no impact. It could be the introduction of tablets or something or cost associated with that, of course. And then as we move up in terms of cost and, and, and implications for the building, there's interior and exterior fit out elements and so on. Um, and then finally, larger kind of spatial layout and structural changes. So this could be extension. It could be major reconfiguring of, of, of the building. Um, it could be going up a floor. It could be going out a block or an extension. Um, so we've just built this into the guidelines that there are, we acknowledge that there are a number of, of scales and we believe the guidelines um, are useful across all of these scales. Now, when we look at the guidelines, um, we've, we've tried to highlight some key issues. First of all, that long-term care settings are people's homes. And while that good infection control um, measures are critical, um, we need to design a built environment that supports quality of life in terms of it being a home. We need to consider um, how to create and maintain safe, accessible, attractive, homely, and comfortable interiors and exteriors for mobility, for social interaction, um, and for resident staff and, and visitors, um, particularly during a pandemic. How do we design to maintain that as much as possible? Some of the key modes of, of transmission of COVID-19 include, as we talked about, droplet or airborne transmission. Therefore, improving um, ventilation um, not only improves quality of life, but is a major infection control measure. And this really can't be stressed enough. Providing an, uh, and, and creating access to outdoor space across all floors and is really critical. And this is something that, again, we're really stressing. We need to take advantage of, of the quality of life improvement of access to outdoor space, but also the fact that it's a much safer space in terms of, of a pandemic, COVID-19 and, and possibly um, other um, airborne infectious diseases also. So you'll find in the document, um, you know, pages and images like this that here, for example, we're providing the guidelines at a glance and, and we're just providing some key bullet points across um, the various spatial scales. I'm not going to get into these in any detail now. You'll find these in the document itself. But here are some of the kind of priority issues that are applicable across all of these scales, right from the site location um, and this kind of site design elements um, down to elements and ventilation and um, technology. So this is a two page spread that you'll find, which I think is a really good low hanging fruit, essentially elements that we can deal with. And again, really shows the kind of convergence between quality of life and infection control. And again, just as and you'll see, I've written here as sample pages throughout the document, you'll get images which show um, good practice, uh, mostly from from Irish settings. Um, and illustrative uh, plans and drawings which show some major concepts and some major ideas. They're not meant to be prescriptive in any way, just to show you a, um, examples of, of the key issues and to illustrate some of the points we're talking about. And then throughout the, guide, throughout the guidance document, you'll get quite precise um, bulleted guidance um, and, and uh, across all of the bed spatial scales as discussed. Now, finally, to say that, um, that the research and the guidelines themselves has you know, acknowledged the existing um, key policy context and through all our stakeholders and, and our steering committee which um, have been discussed earlier on and worked were so generous with their time and expertise it, we were 
we were we were keen to make sure that that the that our guidelines and research acknowledged um, the great policy and some of the great policy and, and that's there. So um, you know we're the document and research and do, and, the, and the guidelines themselves is is obviously cognizant of the Health Act and and regulations around bedroom size and so on. Um, of course, the 2017 HICWA guidance um, on dementia care for designated centres for older people, very interesting document. Um, they, there is a, a 2016 HSE design brief that specifically looks at 10, a 10 bed dementia specific household in residential care centres. Again, very interesting and a lot to learn from that. Um, of course, there was the expert panel on nursing homes, and there was a lot of, of uh, recommendations there on the built environment, and that has been really critical to, to our research. And then finally, I suppose at a slightly bigger level, um, the housing options for our aging population, um, which is a document that is about housing, not the, the nursing home sector per se, um, but, but does contain some actions around residential care settings and ensuring that they're put in the right location um, in terms of community and amenity and, and so on. And, and that document, I think, also does a good job in acknowledging the spectrum of residential care from, from private through to supported and into nursing homes. And, and I think that interface between the various um, levels of care required in different kind of residential settings is really important and, and probably something that's gonna become much more important into the future. So that's just a quick kind of glance at, at, at some of the at some of the key setting, at some of the key policy um, that we're um, that we're covering. So um, on that note, um, I'll thank you for your attention and um, we'll talk to you soon. Thank you very much, Tom, for that excellent presentation. It's great to have a, a presentation like that when picking up a new document with the level of detail in the re research report and the guidelines. And I think, I hope that's very useful for anybody who hopes to read uh, the new documents as an introduction to their content. Um, our steering group have been mentioned a few times already this morning. And now we have two presentations with some reflections on the project from two members of our steering group, from Celine Clark from Age Action and from Dr. Emer Coveney from Age Friendly Ireland. Thank you for the invitation today to present Age Action's reflections on the guidelines of the universal design for improving the quality of life and enhancing COVID-19 infection control in existing residential care settings for older people research report. It's quite a mouthful. So a little bit about Age Action. So we are Ireland's leading advocacy organisation on ageing and older people. We seek to make a fundamental change in the lives of older people by eliminating age discrimination, promoting positive aging and securing their right to comprehensive and high quality services. But ultimately we advocate for a society that enables all of us and all older people to participate and to live full independent lives based on the realization of their rights and equality and recognizing the diversity of their situation and experience. So Age Action, as I said, is an advocacy organization. So we develop research evidence-based policy positions, which are value the lived experience of older people, because we fundamentally believe that people should be able to participate in the design and implementation of policies that directly affect them. We then advocate and we seek to inform and influence key actors, including policymakers. And we do this through a variety of fora, including those that are on your screen now. So as I said, our focus is on ageism, eliminating it, overcoming barriers to participation, addressing cumulative disadvantage that people experience over the life course, as well as adopting a rights-based approach to the design, planning and implementation because that will ultimately help address the core issues. So looking at this report, I look at it through a lens of rights, human rights. And so for me then, I seek to, to, to identify the key rights issues in the report and, how, and also the approach that the report took. <laughs> 
So we can see that there's a rights-based approach, there's a participatory methodology and that ultimately informs recommendations that seek to uphold rights. There's also a fundamental recognition that the setting is somebody's home. And for us then that falls into the realm of policy making to support aging in place, which is also a stated government commit commitment. So the approach of the research team, which is the methodology and their fundamental understanding that this is someone's home, produce a set of guidelines that are in line with a rights-based approach. So if we look at aging in place first, that means that somebody wants to age in the home or at least in the community in which they have built their lives. And there are a number of fundamental shifts in policy that need to be taken in order to support people to be able to age, age in place. And meaning that they have choice and control over where and how they age. But we must recognize that some people will need more acute care at some point in their lives and so may end up living in a residential care setting for a short term or a long term. Ultimately, for some people, this could be the last home in which they live. And people should have a choice and control over their own lives with the right to family life and to autonomy, regardless of their accommodation setting. So the fundamental principle that this is someone's home guided the research team in their approach to fully understand what home means. And this is reflected in the recommendations, including recommendation one, which is overarching design characteristics, features or approaches. And the second one, which is on site location, inclusion, access, interaction with community and health spaces. Age Action would ask that these recommendations should inform the planning guidelines and regulation of both existing and future bills. So let's go back to a rights based approach, because we believe that that empowers people to know and to claim their rights. And if people know how and are able to claim their rights and how they decide what health and social care services they wish to receive. This in turn will impact on the quality of health and social care services provided to them and people will be held to account to higher standards and people-centered care. Central to the realization of rights in this context is the adoption of a rights framework to integrated care. One that supports the participation of older people in decision making and with effective and accessible remedies for to remedy disputes. So that brings us to advocate for the panel principles, which are international good practice and support the participation of people who are directly affected by the policy in the design and implementation and evaluation of the policy. There have been positive developments in, uh, um, in the human rights based framework in general. But further clarity, guidance and investment is needed really to bring human rights compliance in health and social care up to a standard and to make sure that all future legislative and policy in the area should adopt a rights framework in their work. So a rights-based approach to this report is evidence in the guidelines that seek to uphold the rights that are reflective of the work that needs to be done to ensure that the design and the location of care facilities, including in particular nursing homes, caters for key quality of life considerations, community access, maximizing individual capacity and self-expression and individual preferences. So the report, comes into a policy framework that delivers and supports long-term residential care. So the system of care, as far as age action is concerned, is biased towards residential care and congregated settings due to the absence of a statutory home care scheme, which would put home care on an equal footing to nursing home care, such as through the nursing home support scheme. Alternative models of care for people who need high dependency care must be considered to promote older people's safety, rights, independence and quality of life in line with a rights based approach to care and the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. 
And while the nursing home support scheme is a large area of health expenditure, there needs to be much more consideration and focus on the outcomes, quality of life domains, and the creation of greater choice to reflect the will and preference of people who live in nursing homes. The physical infrastructure of many nursing homes as congregated institutional settings create situations where residents' rights to dignity and privacy are not upheld. HICWA consistently reports that a significant number of centres for older persons fail to conform to premises regulations, which means that the people who live in these centres experience poor quality of life. HICWA notes that centres that struggle to comply with the regulations on, on premises also struggle to achieve compliance with infection control. The difficulty in meeting these premises requirements of the 2013 regulations was experienced by some providers and then led to an extension in 2016 to allow providers until 2021 to achieve compliance with physical infrastructure requirements. This is sort of a generous time frame in the context of the average length of stay in a nursing home is about 2.9 years. So in conclusion, as an organization working for equality and rights for all of us as we age, Age Action welcomes this report. It also wants to pay tribute to the methodology that informed the report and led to really strong rights-based approach guidelines. <clears throat> There's a participatory nature there was a value on the lived experience of older people. The residential setting was fundamentally recognized as someone's home and that guided the entire project. And there's a recognition that people who have rights regardless of their place of accommodation and the importance of the built environment in supporting people to realize their rights. The research shows that putting people at the center of design and implementation supports dignity, independence, diversity, and ultimately equality of outcome for individuals. While the majority of people want to age in place, some will need more acute care, and so residential settings will be needed. So this report is an important contribution to Ireland's reimagining of the provision of a continuum of care model that is urgently needed. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Emer Copney. I'm the National Programme Manager for Age Friendly Ireland, which is a shared service of local government hosted by Mead County Council. So firstly, just to say that Age Friendly Ireland really welcomes these new guidelines for the design of long -term residential care facilities. We're really delighted to have been part of the process of developing the materials and to have had the opportunity to support the research team. Research is particularly important and welcome in an age-friendly context as it helps to prepare society for population aging, something we're all trying to do, ensuring that older people can continue to have a good quality of life regardless of their housing choices in their later years. Trinity House guidelines help us to reconceptualise our understanding of long-term residential care facilities, serving to shift the thinking about these buildings from being merely clinical institutions to understanding them in a much more holistic way and in the context of being a home environment for the people who live there. The research process explored the concept of what makes a building a home and what makes it feel like a home and how this can be enhanced through good design and planning while also considering infection prevention and control, again helping us to prepare for future outbreaks. With the population ageing trend that's facing us in Ireland and internationally, there will be an increased demand for residential care. So these guidelines are a really excellent resource to help us to plan to meet for this demand and to consider the types of residential facilities that should be developed to best support quality of life in older age. A note in the guidelines, there's an emphasis on smaller scale models, such as the greenhouse model, and on proximity to town centres, something we advocate for ourselves. Listening to the voice of older people is a core ethos of the National Age Friendly Programme. And this ethos is very much reflected in the research process for older people in residential care, their family members and staff were asked about their experiences. And the case study approach used allowed for a deep dive into specific facilities to more fully understand the lived experience of residents. The recommendations in the guidance bring to the fore key design issues, such as the need for suitable visitor facilities that recognise the importance of family and friends being able to meet with their loved ones, regardless of restrictions. Also, the importance of site selection that uh, helps with integration into the wider community and the need for outdoor space which has the dual benefit of you know, reducing the risk of viral transmission and also connecting 
uh, older people with the environment. We saw during COVID that COVID care concerts could be delivered in settings that had outdoor space and gardens and how important this was for the residents and how very welcome these concerts were by the residents. Another important point is around the use of technology to support information and communication and social connections. The absence of technology in residential care came to the fore during the pandemic because it wasn't routine practice for nursing home residents or indeed many of us to use Zoom um, or other digital platforms for social contacts. And in fact, this fact was addressed by the HSE in 2020 when they worked with Age Friendly Ireland to fund the supply of digital devices to nursing homes throughout the country. And this process was managed by the 31 local age friendly programmes to manage distribution. The Age Friendly Shared Service has worked with partners to produce related guidance material around age friendly homes and site selection for older people's housing. And some of the key takeaways in the Trinity House guidance material are very much echoed in our own resources, such as a focus on integration into the community, proximity to services, universal design, and how uh, the built environment can support quality of life. Another key recommendation from the research relates to site design, the importance of choosing an appropriate site to ensure the facility is integrated into the wider community, not segregated. So in a parallel piece of work, the Age Friendly Shared Service has been working with the Department of Housing, Local Government and Heritage to develop a site selection tool for age friendly housing, as we likewise recognise the importance of the location of older people's housing within the wider community context. Age Friendly Ireland has had a significant focus on the themes of health and housing over the past few years, as these are two of the core domains of the World Health Organization's Global Age Friendly Programme, which we are an affiliate member. And indeed, Tom Gray has presented his research at one of our recent international webinars, um, where he underscored how the guidelines being launched today support nearly all of the eight WHO age friendly domains, since they have a potential to impact on areas such as social participation, civic participation and respect and social inclusion, as well as the obvious ones of health and housing. The guidelines acknowledge the diversity that exists within the population of older people. We are always saying in the shared service, older people are not a homogeneous group, but they have very different needs, depending on the level of health, functional ability, personal interests and background. So bringing a universal design lens to residential settings takes account of the needs of all older people, and indeed everyone across the life course, including staff and visitors. COVID has presented opportunities for all of us to reflect on our living environments. And through our network of older people's councils, many people have highlighted to us important features of a home, such as access to a garden or green space for exercise, good broadband connectivity, and their reflection on the overall utility and comfort of their home after a period of lockdown. So it's very important that the same opportunity was applied to the residential care sector as older people living in residential care are often considered harder to reach from a research perspective. Another piece of research we just launched uh, this month with the HSE focused on older people's health and well-being during the pandemic, and it documented the range of initiatives that were developed to support older people at this time by state agencies and NGOs and community and voluntary groups. These initiatives are now available on a searchable online repository on the Age Friendly Ireland website, also um, as a legacy document, and they contribute to the bank of resources that are there to support older people's health and well-being. We are looking forward to supporting the dissemination of the universal design guidelines on residential care settings. And one platform we would like to use for this is the Age Friendly Homes website, which was developed as an action under the Housing Options for Aging Population Policy Statement. So the website is designed for housing practitioners and individuals and developers as a bank of resources, including case studies, research evidence and design templates. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge um, how fortunate we are to have the Centre for Excellence in, Un Excellence in Universal Design, which is based in the National Disability Authority here in Ireland. Um, Age Friendly Ireland has a long-standing relationship with CEUD and we utilise all of their guidance material in our own Age Friendly resources, whether that relates to customer communication or digital accessibility or the built environment. So the guidance material from Trinity House today is very much welcomed as a framework for planning for new long-term residential care facilities and also as a supporting toolkit for facilities that are undergoing renovation or restructuring of their service. The Age Friendly Ireland programme is hosted by the local government sector, so I'm certain that the guidance will be extremely useful to local government as a planning authority and also um, to the Age Friendly programme in terms of um, staff in the network of Age Friendly Housing Technical Advisors and the Age Friendly programme managers themselves. 
who are working closely with residential care facilities at local level. On a broader level, um, I very much welcome the collaboration between local government and the academic sector, as it enhances our ability to, to deliver quality services and to deliver on our strategic objectives. We've sought to increase our own in-house research expertise. Um, we have a dedicated research office now in the HRN Assured Service through a partnership with Maynooth University, and we also have links with universities uh, around the country as well. Um, in, in the context of this research, it, uh, local government has been very involved in placemaking through public groundwork and community development around the country. But I suppose this has been a good opportunity for us to look at placemaking in the context of residential care. Um, I'd also hope that ac the academic sector sees the benefit of linking with local government and other public service providers in terms of having an implementation infrastructure for research recommendations, as I'm sure will be the case with these guidelines. So finally, I would just like to thank and commend the researchers for the excellent piece of work. And I do believe that the impact of the guidance in this area will be felt long into the future, not only by the current generation of older people, but future generations who choose residential care. Thank you. Thank you very much, Celine and Deemer, for those really interesting reflections on the project. So we're now at the live um, part of our launch today, our question and answer session. I'm joined here by Professor Des O'Neill, by Demetra and by Tom Gray, and we also have Ger Craddock, who's coming in remotely. Um, we have a question to start with, Des, which I think maybe you can answer first. Uh, it says, who are the guidelines aimed at? Will they become mandatory design standards? And if not, why not? Thanks very much. Uh, these guidelines are for everybody. They're for uh, advocacy groups. They're for the general public. Uh, they're for those involved with um, academically, professionally, in the, in the health and care professions, social work around developing the standards. I think they're particularly, hopefully, of uh, exceptionally important focus for the Department of Health, uh, for the HSE and for HICWA. Um, there really has been a vacuum in this area around how we provide the design and build, how we get all those features that uh, Tom, Demetra were, were outlining and indeed in my own introduction. And indeed we have let much of the design run unchecked to date. And there certainly will be a call for significant retrofit um, for these to uh, become incorporated, I think there needs to be a work of reflection uh, in the Department of Health, in the HSE and in HICWA, informed hopefully by advocacy, and we've heard advocacy today, informed by academia. Um, these are quite substantial changes, but they're really, really important, and they're part of, part of all our common fate. So I think everybody listening in today, and we're delighted to get a good group and a good range of people listening in today, and indeed also in our broader SFI project, which we'll be briefly mentioning or has been mentioned already, um, we, we will be having a workshops here, we'll be having a website which will try and develop outwards uh, the, the, the findings of both projects. Um, I think also a, a particular and perhaps um, to particularly mention, I think, the CEUD and the NDA. Uh, the, the, the NDA has been an important voice for advocacy around how life is arranged, about how us, the presently able-bodied, um, should be considering our own existential vulnerability. I think the CEUD library that this is going to join is a very powerful basis upon which people can uh, make recent judgment. It's, it's, a, it's a lodestone, it's a catalyst. So the answer is we'd love to see these involved. But can I just say one thing? There's a danger sometimes in overemphasizing regulation. We don't regulate how hotels are, where we go on our holidays, or what the leisure type facilities are. We create an expectation. And if we don't create that expectation of what we're going to get, the real problem with regulation is that the, the minimum becomes the maximum, and particularly in business settings, people will become ace out at how to navigate and tick box the regulations. 
So regulations are never, they're really important, but they're never going to be enough. But certainly the regulations do need to step up very significantly in, in the national standards for residential care. They need to lean off currently the ones from those for uh, disability and they need to up their game considerably. So that's probably the first port to call. Thanks very much for that, Des. Um, I'd also like maybe to bring in Ger Craddock, the head of our Centre of Universal Design. Ger, if you'd like to add a few words to that. Yeah, thanks very much, Ruth, and uh, well done on, on today's uh, session. Sorry, I'm not there live with you. Uh, yeah, I, I would concur with a lot, but Des says there, I think we've, in our audience today, um, virtually, we, we have HICWA and we have Department of Health. So again, uh, very much our role in the centre is to provide advice uh, to government and very much looking at best practice, both nationally and internationally. So how that can be applied, uh, definitely we'll be have further discussions with Department of Health and HICWA, uh, how these can be applied within their own work. And, and I suppose uh, echoing what Des is saying there, uh, we, we try to, uh, as I said, promote best practice regulation can often be uh, whatever minimum rather than what is, uh, as, as Des says, uh, the expectation for people out there that they're looking for a quality service, quality environment, that they feel safe uh, and uh, that they, again, the infection control, as we've talked about here this morning, uh, being a, a critical factor in quality of life and people feeling very safe and comfortable within a nursing home uh, or residential, other residential settings. Thanks very much, Ger. Um, I think we also have some researchers in our audience and we have a question around um, how the the COVID-19 pandemic influ influenced the research process. And I think, Dimitri, you might talk to that a little bit. Yep. Yeah, that's not a problem. I can uh, talk a little bit about um, our research process um, for this project. You know, of course, in all of the work that we've done where, we, where we've engaged with, um, with uh, individuals to capture lived experience, our aim is always to be on site and to be running in-person uh, uh, interviews, um, questionnaires, workshops. Um, in the case of this particular project, we had to, and we're very grateful for the support that we've received from um, our case studies in helping us to gather the information for this project. Um, and we've had to do a lot um, from, via you know, the virtual kind of space. So relying a lot on Zoom and having to think a little bit outside of the box while well, inside of a box uh, uh, and be creative about how we run our workshops and how we run our engagement. And I think, I know I only mentioned it very briefly in my presentation, but we did, um, as a result of our being restricted from being in the sites themselves, we did come up with a very innovative um, way to capture the lived experience with the What Does Home Mean to Us workshop. And so we piloted it during the CUD project. We're very grateful um, to have that opportunity. And um, we're hopeful that we're able to maybe run a few um, in-person sessions as part of the SFI project. In fact, I'm supposed to go to a nursing home uh, next week, but that's been postponed um, So because of COVID. Um, the, the, the last thing I'll say, is that um, in addition to the engagement we do with the questionnaires and workshops, one of the big things, in, in not just in this project, but in any project where we're looking at the built environment, is that as researchers, we want to go into these settings so that we can experience them, um, breathe them in, and have a feel of them for ourselves um, as we're doing the other parts of the engagement. So that, unfortunately, wasn't something we were able to do in our three case studies for the CUD. Um, that said, when we, we did do the interviews for the lived experience for the, the case for the launch this morning, um, very grateful that we were able to go into a setting and just get a bit of a feel of the environment and just you know kind of sit and watch how residents and how staff are moving through the different spaces to see how the dining room is set up and how it's still kind of following the social distancing rules 
And then when you're when we had the conversations with um, Eileen and Bridget, they were uh, more there was a better understanding because we'd been in the setting ourselves. So um, while we weren't able to do it because of COVID, we look forward now to having a bit more freedom going forward and experiencing some of these setting in our future research. Thanks very much, Demetra, for that. Uh, Tom, we have a question uh, relating to Irish practice as well, I suppose, as international practice. It says, when the documents refer to small scale or household models, does this include the Chilock model, which is a small model, a small scale model of care developed in Ireland? Yeah, good question. And it depends what part of the country you come from, whether you say Chilock or Choglock. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'll say Choglock. Um, yeah, no, absolutely. The Choglock model, I think, was developed, I mean, some very interesting documents written back in 2011, I think, mm. and Coyle and, and, and so on with the HSE. Mm. Um, places to flourish, and, and they described the, the Choglock model, which was the household model, or a smaller scale living. Um, very much what we're talking about, like the greenhouse model and so on, where you have a smaller amount of residents um, living in, a, in, a, in their own quarters, sharing a dining room, living room, outdoor space, and so on. And, so on. and this model, of course, is, is also referenced in the 2016 um, 10-person brief that we mentioned earlier on. So we, we have it here, and we have good I think we have good research and we have good literature to support that. Okay, that's very interesting. Um, another question, um, which is about the location and site, some of those design guidelines. We often think more about the actual nursing home building and the internal spaces when we think about design for long-term care. And this research is also looking at the site. So what are some of the key site design issues that we need to consider in terms of quality of life and infection control? I take that I one again. That yeah, okay. Tom, yeah. yeah, we do. We tend to. I think we tend to focus very much on the building and, and what's happening inside. And of course, that's really important. But but where we locate is is really critical. And I know in this in this project we're talking about existing settings. So if we're looking at the site. Of course, we can look at simple things like the provision of outdoor space. We can look at um, the flexibility of the site, so you can provide um, you know movement, restricted movement, or particular parking spaces or access for um, family members and, and staff members accessing the site during emergency times. But I think there's another very simple thing, this relationship with the community and, and the outdoor world. We know that people felt very isolated or restricted within the site or within their setting. And, and we know from, particularly I think from, from interna some international models or models in the States where they provide balconies and verandas an outdoor space where people can still be on site and can still be protected, but they have that relationship with the community. Um, so I think that's a really important bit in terms of site design, that interaction at an interface with the outside world and how we think about that in terms of locating our building and designing our site in general. Okay, very good. Um, okay, let's look at some of the other questions we have. I think this is an important one um, and I suppose it's, our video today was from uh, two residents. We had also hoped actually to have some staff testimony on that video, but it wasn't possible. Um, and this question says, while residents and family members suffered because of COVID-19, it was also an extremely hard time for staff. Does this research or guidelines address staff issues? Um, Des, do you want to take that one? Yeah. No, not, not specifically in the sense of staffing. And again, those who watch Joe Biden's State of the Union address will notice that he, among many others in the Western world and elsewhere, are recognizing that we haven't really focused on uh, staffing, on its quality, on its uh, resilience in terms of background. But on the other hand, one of our key international collaborators who, for in Australia, who's asked to come and design a nursing home, he says, well, the first thing I want to see are your care pathways and your care staffing. So, you know, form has to follow function. And for us, we think that part of, a part of our process also is that we have included the views in staff in how the nursing home should be designed, in what they see as problems, as what they see as opportunities. So the needs of staff are hugely central uh, to to uh, just as much as the res well the residents first families but the staff are vitally important so they're absolutely central to this project absolutely central to the SFI project but in terms of their actual numbers and other elements uh, 
that really is a work which, again, the ministerial panel should be addressing, and please keep an eye out for that spot there. Uh, and I think it's also one that the professions themselves, I think the professions themselves have perhaps not been as attentive, and, and this is across the board, across the professions, uh, to thinking, well, actually, this is a group with people with quite complex care needs. How are we going to uh, manage this? How are we going to support the staff? So there's, a, there's a, uh, quite a few groups of people that have deep reflection to be doing around this. Okay, now I think both Tom and Ramitra want to come in on that as well. Tom, will we go to you first? Yeah, uh, so absolutely, as Des says, um, the work doesn't deal with staffing and so on, but in terms of the built environment, we do look at, at staff welfare. And, you know, the research showed us that staff worked under extremely difficult conditions. And in, in, many, in many cases, without proper facilities, without proper respite spaces, without proper changing facilities, without proper showering. So the international evidence shows us that this was, was an issue in terms of staff stress. So you'll find in our guidelines there is a section 3.4, I think, um, which deals specifically with staff facilities. And this is around providing those kinds of spaces. The respite space that staff can go into with proper light, with, with views, with comfortable and accessible seating and spaces and so on, and with, and with good changing facilities. Also, the use of, of outdoor space for staff. We've seen that in certain care settings that have you know, really nice outdoor space and staff use it as well in terms of having their lunch, in terms of... Um, in terms of socialising with each other um, and so on. So I think the built environment has a, a huge role here to play in terms of staff welfare. Okay. Yeah, and just to add on to, to both, just very to say that for the questionnaires for staff, while we didn't ask about quality of life for them specifically, we did ask about their reflections and, uh, on the role of the built environment in supporting or hindering quality of life for residents. And so there was a lot of rich material that's come out of that. And I think the last thing I will say, and this is both in the context of this project, but in any healthcare setting project that we've been involved in in the past for the hospital project and before, when you engage with staff, you find that they already have a really keen and strong understanding of the role and the impact of the built environment on health and well-being. So you're not going in and introducing a new um, element to them. They already have such an understanding of it. And so that we make sure that we capture that in our questionnaire. And so that's going to, that's come through in the CUD report, but it's going to come through again as well in the SFI research. Okay, thanks very much. If I might just make one last comment is uh, we've been interested as a group in a thing called clinicians for design. And again, what we'd like to see evolving is where staff feel more empowered uh, to get engaged with their environment. So it hasn't really been a part of our, our training as nurses, as doctors, or therapists, healthcare attendants, but actually to feel actually, yeah, I have a role here. Mm -hmm. So we hope that this document will be read by the, by the health and, and care professions okay. as well. Yeah. Thanks very much, Des. Um, we have one more question, and I think everybody has learned an awful lot about the importance of ventilation and air and fresh air during COVID-19. And we have a question in relation to that. And Tom, I think this might be one, one for you as well. As a result of COVID-19, ventilation and air quality have emerged as key concerns. What are the simple things I could do now in my setting to improve these? Yeah, that's a, a really good point, um, a really good question. Um, and I think ventilation is one of those things you can do right now, um, improving ventilation without having to get into any kind of retrofit and so on. So while the guidelines deal with the kind of key design issues or adaptation issues, right now you can look at three areas. I suppose you can look at um, ventilation itself, so that's making sure the room is well ventilated, making sure it's achieving the right number of air changes, um, and conduct things like um, purging, which is essentially opening all the windows in a space and flushing the air out. Okay. Um, so that's, that's obviously three things you can do around ventilation. Um, you could also look at uh, filtration, which, you know, and we've seen it in a lot of our settings, we've seen it in, um, in healthcare settings, in educational settings, in classrooms and so on, the portable HEPA filters. Um, very effective in terms of filtering the air and cleaning the air and um, pretty cheap in, in the scheme of things um, and then finally monitoring I think it's become something none of us understood really the importance of air quality and if you talk to people in the past about you know the results or monitoring of their of their space and they wouldn't have understood now people have portable air air quality monitors and they're looking at it whether it's saying orange green or red if it's red in classrooms or healthcare settings people are opening doors and windows and this is about um, using CO2 levels as a proxy for air, uh, air quality. It's not necessarily telling us 
about infection rate, but it's telling us about the quality and the freshness of the air. So portable CO2 monitors, um, quite cheap, they can be put in the space and, and, and can be used for to monitor the, the quality. So those three things around, around just ventilation, around filtration and around monitoring are, are three simple things we can do. Okay, thanks very much. And I think when you say that about how much we've all learned, I know in my, my Pilates class last week, there was a monitor there that we were all asked to keep an eye on. So it really yeah. has kind of come to the fore, I think, everywhere now as a result of our experiences during the pandemic. I, I, I think so. And I think yeah. there's been some great advocates in the area. We spoke um, in depth with Ola Hegarty in UCD. who has been really pushing this area, to be fair. And, and she's you know, put, uh, put out there some um, material available for the general public and healthcare settings and so on around, you know, the very simple steps you can do. So, you know, experts like that have been really important. Okay, thanks very much. Um, that comes to the end of our questions. So I might move to you, Dev, maybe if you could maybe talk a little bit about next steps, because I know that this project is also kind of complementary to other work that you're doing. Yeah. Thanks very much, uh, Ruth. And uh, again, I think we'd just like to, on, on behalf of the research team, express our thanks not only to the steering group, uh, which has helped us with our other uh, project, a related project as well, but also the CEUD. Uh, this has been a fantastic journey with us, but it's a journey that has a relevance that perhaps has become interestingly since this project uh, arose, we in geriatric medicine are seeing a fairly steady stream of referrals from disability services for uh, older people with disability uh, to be cleared for the what's known as the fair deal for nursing home settings. So um, there actually is now a move back towards recongregation in a way and recongregation in a way uh, that lacks an ID focus, an intellectual disability focus. So I think actually I'm beginning, sometimes when you do a project, it brings out extra elements and I think there needs to be stronger talking between and deeper engagement which of the sort we've seen here between uh, the aging sector and the disability sector and this is widely recognized in the literature that you know they're 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 not always talking um in 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 the same kind of way and there's huge amounts to learn from each other the aging sector has learned so much from the emphasis on personal liberty the emphasis on flourishing and freedom uh, from the disability sector. So this has been an extraordinary journey and I think it, it's one that's really uh, beginning to grow. Our larger project, and again, we're very grateful to Science Foundation Ireland uh, uh, to have awarded us a grant, which builds off this into a larger context with uh, a wider range of nursing homes, but also with uh, international uh, examples, uh, with literature reviews, and with some very focused down, further focused down work on what, what quality of life actually means and what domains are there. So uh, this, in, in some ways, it, it has differences, it, but it has parallels. Uh, we'll be running a, a workshop in late spring, early summer. We'll be having a website. And we hope that, you know, we are, I suppose, tremendously excited that uh, this up hitherto uh, neglected area potentially allows us to start looking at nursing home environments that are more clearly embedded in people's communities. I think we heard this, uh, there really is some concern about large, very large nursing homes being built very far from where, where people live and we need to, to be really rethinking that, that, that the nursing home setting uh, should be one that, uh, that people begin to identify with as part of their of their of their common fate, and this does not take in, away in any way. And in some of the reassuring news, just just to say that I often wonder: Do people think this is going to be something that is a kind of the unfortunate phrase tsunami? Nursing home use has been dropping in virtually every Western country around the world. As a, we grow fitter and healthier in later life, and b, as community services improve. So it really is important to recognize this is a, a manageable problem. With an increasing older population but diminishing use, it's very much a steady state problem. And finally, I think we will find, and I, I think this resonates with the work of CEUD, is by getting the design right at the beginning. There is front loading of costs. There may be a somewhat different financial model, but we are convinced, and we're very careful, can, 
convictions can be a greater enemy of truth than lies, but we are convinced that, um, that front-loading, good design, uh, inclusive, universal design, and at the heart of this is a universal design um, that in fact reflects uh, our universal humanity, is that the nursing home environment will, in time, and hopefully sooner rather than later, one which we can be proud of. Thanks. Dev, thanks very much. And what you said there, it really does resonate with the work that we do in the center. I'm just going to ask Jared to come in for a minute because I know, um, Jared, that bridge between aging and disability is something you're very passionate about. Yeah, <clears throat> thanks, Ruth. Yeah, I, I was involved uh, at the very early stages uh, drafting of the Disability Act going back into the 90s. So, um, yeah, coming from uh, a, a disability sector uh, in my previous work, it was actually seeing that bridge um, where universal design, uh, coming from Ron Mace in the States, was making that link. And as Des says, it's about universal humanity uh, being the basis of our work. How do we engage with diverse stakeholders uh, and bringing groups together? And then the room you're in there, I. I I call it the magic room uh, within the NDA. Lots of magic happens uh, when people come together, uh, share share a biscuit or a cup of tea, and 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 things. Uh, lots of positives comes out of that. So, yeah, uh, yeah, it it is bringing them groups together, and and that's our role as a as as a national centre uh, to promote that and engage. I mean, we've. We've been successful, but more work to be done on that. Uh, and before I hand back to Ruth, I'd just like to congratulate everybody today and, and Ruth and Linda from, from the team in the centre uh, for the great work on bringing this together. And of course, the researchers and the steering group uh, and the residents, of course, been very important as part of that. So uh, that's my hand back to Ruth uh, on the great job she's done there this morning. Thanks very much, Jar. And I suppose here we want to say thank you for staying at home today, as is many of the, the public health ads at the moment. Um, I think that's going to bring our, our launch today to a close. I hope all of you watching found it valuable, and I hope that you find the research and the guidelines will be useful to you in your work. Um, I just want to reiterate again our thanks to our steering group. This project involved a, a large number of people. Um, I think I'll name them. So there's ourselves in Trinity House obviously working on this together, but we also had IIGNA, we have at Nursing Homes Ireland, Age Friendly Ireland. Um, we have O'Connell Mahan Architects advising Sage Advocacy, uh, the HSE Estates. Um, we have Age Action and we have the Irish Association of Directors of Nursing and Midwifery. And I have to say there are two um, logos on the screen, which with my short sightedness, I'm not able to read at the moment. But again, I just want to say thank you very much to everybody on our steering group for your work and for helping us with this project. Um, and so we leave it at that. Thank you very much. <laughs>